Hi, Jeffrey. Hi. How are we? We're doing good. Everybody's excited. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming uh, all the way up from LA. We appreciate the visit. Good. Excited to be here. We're very excited to have you. That was an incredible list of accomplishments, and you started it off without getting a degree. Can you tell us why? Um, I will, but I, you know, I actually, um, uh, I've always found uh, in speaking in front of any groups, it's actually valuable for me to know a little bit about the audience. Um, and so if I could just do a really quick survey of uh, how many uh, foams are there here that are headed to Vegas tonight? Could I see a show of hands? <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> so I would just want to give you uh, sort of two things that I, I might be able to uh, help you out on. The first is likely probably not a lot of people in this room um, that could give you wardrobe advice as to how to dress for the 1970s. <laughs> I actually can do that. I have knowledge and experience there. Um, and probably more importantly than that, um, you should know that um, right around the corner from the Marquee Club at the Cosmopolitan is the best pizza in Las Vegas. It's called Secret Pizza. It is a secret. Um, but now there are a couple of hundred of you that know the secret. It's open till 5 a.m., which is, I'm sure, right around the time in which you'll be wanting and jonesing on some pizza. So <clears throat> I did not go to college. <laughs> um, uh, it's an interesting thing that I uh, partnered in 1994 with Steven Spielberg and David Geffen. Uh, the three of us do actually do not have a college degree, so whatever that's worth. For, um, I didn't go to college because I actually started working um, very young as a teenager. I volunteered for a, a, a man who ran for uh, mayor of New York City, John Lindsay, who had been a congressman on the Upper East Side. Um, and uh, uh, Lindsay was really a, an incredibly uh, charismatic, um, a very uh, forward-thinking, very, um, uh, I think, uh, engaging and thoughtful, unique, liberal politician, um, and um, came in a time and an era where um, participating and giving and being involved in civic, um, you know, was pretty powerful. You know, the late 60s was, you know, uh, a time of a lot of um, civil rights movements, uh, uh, really, ch you know, changing moments in our culture and our society. And being there uh, uh, in uh, politics, in government, was a very exciting thing. And I started very young as a teenager and continued to work. And when that moment, I, I actually I did go to college for a moment. I registered at uh, NYU because it was the closest college to City Hall. Um, and in that era, you actually only had to hand your class card in and then show up for exams. So it was uh, uh, pretty easy for me to go to college. <laughs> uh, and um, the, um, I think the first, in 1970, the first midterm exam uh, overlapped with the first police strike in a uh, modern city in America. <laughs> the police uh, went on strike in New York City, which had never happened before. And I thought I could do better there than uh, in a college classroom, and that was the end of my college career. <laughs> what did you learn from those years that you've taken into your career later? Oh, everything. I mean, it was just, it was a, a lesson, it were lessons in life and, and about uh, people and, you know, values and uh, seeing the harsh realities of the streets of New York and the goods, the bads, and the uglies. And honestly, there's not, in those uh, five or six, seven years that I work for the mayor, I actually saw everything. Uh, I was a uh, advance uh, uh, man for the mayor uh, and who loved to be on the streets of New York, felt that he should be there whenever 
wherever anything uh, exceptional or extraordinary was happening, and it required the resources of government to be there and respond. So every time and any time anything bad happened, he wanted to show up and make sure the government was there doing its job. So whether it's a tenement would burn down, or a subway accident, or a police officer shot in the line of duty, or you know a water main break, or anything that was at all disruptive, um, he felt as the leader of the city he should be there front and center to see that the city did its, its job. And so for me as an advanced man, it pretty much put me in the wrong place at the wrong time pretty much every, every day. And so you learn about amazing, amazing things about life and death and, and you know, uh, uh, moments of you know, happiness and sacrifice and just everything. It's just the entire rainbow of colors of you know, everything around life were reflected in those experiences. And I think they you know, just served me very well and they matured me in a way and they gave me a confidence about um, uh, myself, I think, which was you know, unique and, and for somebody so young. I had these life experiences at an extremely early age. And a sense of responsibility as a leader that would... Yeah, that you can make a difference. You know, this idea that, you know, you, you can't change the course of things, I don't, I don't buy that about anything. But particularly, um, you know, I think that, um, and even today, I think about it, people feel like, well, if you don't like something, what do you do about it? And I would say, well, you have two things. Um, and, and they are invaluable, and I think we tend not to understand how important and how valuable they are. It's your voice and your vote. And so right now, today, you know, we're sort of going sideways here. You know, for, for me in politics today, I don't think there's ever been a more important time in which we have to exercise our voice and our vote. And we have elections that are coming up later this year. We have elections that are coming up in, you know, a little more than two and a half years. And um, for me, in terms of what I'm more focused on than anything else today, is I would love to see this next election uh, cycle, these next two election cycles, particularly 2020, I would like to see a participation and a turnout in our democracy, the likes of which our country has never experienced before because the stakes have never been higher. And so uh, for this audience in particular, you know, there's nothing more important than voter registration and voter participation. It is the foundation of our democracy, and it is a choice. It is a moment in time in which we actually get to determine the course of our, our country and our leaders. And we only have ourselves to thank or blame for, you know, where we are. Go vote. So that call to foster expression and to, to hear voices, is that what brought you into Hollywood? No, I wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was 22 years old. And so Lindsey ran for president in 1972. Um, I, I worked in Wisconsin and Florida, which were the two primaries. When he lost um, uh, in those primaries and you know, went back to city, government, I did not want to go back to city government because I felt like I had done everything that I could do and I wanted, some, I wanted a new challenge. Um, at 22 years old, I really had sort of risen as far as I was practical in you know, government. Um, I don't think I was going to get made police commissioner or fire commissioner. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so I wanted to go find a career in an industry where at least age would not hold me back, and many people said, go look at entertainment, look at uh, the, the movie business, because it, it is a place in which um, you know, youth is actually um, a, a, a valued asset, not a, not a, not a liability. And so that, that is actually sort of the, the big idea of why. And um, you know, I, I got a couple little opportunities, but then I had the really great fortune of meeting uh, this uh, amazing, amazing uh, person, Barry Diller, uh, who um, invented something called Movies of the Week, which we don't have anymore on TV, but it was a, a real, both a creative and an entrepreneur. And he had just been made the chairman of Paramount Pictures at the age of 34 years old. It was a 
is rather extraordinary. Um, and Barry hired me as his gopher. And, uh, uh, you know, which I think I, I went to work when I was 23. And, and then over the course of the next 11 years um, that I worked at Paramount and I worked for Barry, he did one of the most amazing things, which is he really genuinely mentored me. He invested in me, he believed in me, and he, um, in, a, in a very, really sort of almost thoughtful, methodical way, I didn't understand it at the time, but he had me work in every area of the company. And so by the time I was 29 years old, so I, I'd worked for six years, I was in marketing and distribution and international and negative pickups and TV and, I had all these experiences where I would work for a year or so in one of these, and then he'd move me into something else, and I wasn't, I didn't see any grand plan here in this. I guess I just was getting moved around a bit. Um, but, uh, you know, when I was 29 years old, 30 years old, he made me president of the studio. And I actually could do the job. And the only reason I could do the job is, is that because he had taken the time to actually train me and give me the resources to, to, to function in the job. Can you tell us a little bit about a, a day in the life as the head of a studio? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll focus just maybe narrowly on movies because they're, they're you know, uh, that was what I was doing at uh, Paramount. When I went to Disney, it was sort of a broader job because it, it, it involved, you know, television and animation and whole, m much wider um, uh, responsibilities. But at Paramount and running a studio, um, really is about um, finding great ideas and finding great talent, um, creating um, a great environment for people to be able um, to pursue and realize dreams, even though those dreams in many cases are uh, anywhere between improbable and impossible, um, and to create an environment where um, people have um, the, the ability to fail and to take risk. And the reason for that is, is that great stories, great movie telling is at its best when it's original and unique. And if you sort of think about it almost as a mathematical equation, um, original and unique equals uh, risky. Right, so no, it's not a proven formula. And risky equals, at least to some degree, failure. So if you don't allow some failure in the equation, you're not gonna have people do things that are risky and unique, and if you, I mean, that are unique and original. If you don't have unique and original, everything becomes derivative, and I think uninspired, and you won't have success. So creating a great environment for people to take that appropriate amount of risk and to actually be able to have the ambition to do things that sometimes aren't going to work. Now, very specifically, you know, I, I, uh, I don't, maybe it came from those years, but I have an insane work ethic and, and habit and um, I, I, I get up very early in the morning, um, I have, as some people may have heard, I have multiple breakfasts, multiple lunches, multiple dinners, and how about that, guys? <laughs> <laughs> so that's genetic, get, thank my parents for that. I sleep five hours a night, I thank my parents for that. I don't get jet lag, I thank my parents for that. This is all in the gene pool, I have nothing to do with it, but just, if you only sleep five hours a night, which I have done since I was 15 years old, the Beatles actually wrote a song for me, it's called Eight Days a Week. <laughs> that was for me, anyway, so, I got an extra day and I, 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 I manage my time, I invest my time. And the reason people, you know, nobody's ever actually asked me, so why do you have all these breakfast, lunches, and dinner? I'm going to tell you, including some of my partners who are sitting here in front of me. Um, I have found, as a head of a studio, um, uh, there's, a, there's a very great distance between you and uh, a talent and artist. Uh, and again, there's a, there's a little bit of fear and you know, as you grow both in the job that you have but also reputationally and they create mythology around you. And you know, coming to see me over the years, it started to get to the point where it's like going to see Oz. 
it scares you to death. And I found that the way to like, take that out of the equation was across a table with a meal. And that suddenly, the just the, 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 the relaxed nature of sitting at a table with somebody coming and bringing you know, food and eating just made it, uh, gave me an ability to connect with people way, way, way better than I could across a desk in an office or sitting you know, on the other side of a couch. And so I just found that I'm way more productive. Than so I would get up and I would have breakfast at 6, 7, 8 in the morning. All three of those, by the way. <laughs> and um, uh, so, you know, in a studio, um, you know, a typical Monday morning, we would, uh, uh, the first thing we would do is have a weekend read. So probably maybe the most important, valuable thing as an executive that you have to do is read. Um, and I think that all great, Movies start with a great idea. All great ideas must have a great story. And so reading is essential. <clears throat> and um, I, I will tell you just how demanding it was is a typical week for me when I was at Paramount is I would actually read 10 or 12 screenplays a week. And I'm not a super fast reader. I'm, I, I'm dyslexic. And so I actually have to read a little slow. And so it would take me almost, you know, it would take me almost two hours to read a, a, a screenplay. And I used to actually come start at six o'clock on Saturday mornings and read till five, six o'clock in the afternoon and then come back and probably do about half of that on a, on a Sunday um, for years. I mean, years and years and years. I have read thousands of screenplays, literally. Um, and uh, so then on Monday morning, we all would come in and we would actually talk about what we read and what were the good ideas and who were the great writers. And, um, and then you'd move through the day and there would be things about meeting with filmmakers and hearing what their take on their story was, why they wanted to do it. And then, you know, kind of through the process of a movie of everything from the, you know, uh, uh, assembling the team of, uh, around it, the producers, the directors, the uh, uh, the cast, you know, pretty much every element of it. Where was it going to be done? The budget, the marketing. So these are all elements of movie making, and um, and they're still, you know, kind of relevant today. And it's uh, probably organized a little bit differently today, but certainly back then that was what a what a day was for me. And you know, we would have previews of our movies. We we always found a great collaboration with our audience when we'd have a movie that was a work in progress. Um, uh, being having that moment where a, a, a filmmaker, a storyteller, could actually um, s hear an audience in that sort of just natural, involuntary response to a film, and to see, you know, was it going too fast? Was it going too slow? Was it confusing? It's just, you know, just sitting in the back of an audience. It's not about sort of testing. It's not about sort of filling out preview cards, which I'm sure everybody has done. That stuff's kind of nonsense. But just sitting in an audience, you can tell so much about things that are working and things that are not working. You've described your work ethic and giving all Saturday, part of Sunday, making work your life. Have you seen that have a really strong impact on the teams around you? How has that evolved for you? Well, it's a, fortunately, it's evolved because I started off sort of, I guess, a Neanderthal because I, uh, I actually once said uh, a number of years ago, if you don't come to work on Saturday, don't bother coming on Sunday. Now, <laughs> now here's the problem with that. When I said it, I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the lessons that, you, that I learned, I think anybody learns, is, is that you learn um, that Working smarter sometimes uh, has as much value as working harder. And you also learn that having you know, what is sort of popularly referred to as sort of work-life balance um, is not just a, 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 a nice theoretical thought. I think it's actually true. And so I can kid all I want about it, but the fact is I have a wonderful family. I have, you know, uh, uh, you know, been married for 
45 years to an amazing, amazing partner, have two kids, three grandkids, you know, um, uh, very proud of how my kids grew up and how they became people and found their own identity and their own careers. And, um, and that's, you know, that became as an important part of it. And so, you know, in my 20s, that was probably fine. It's probably fine for all of you. But there's a moment in time in which you actually have to find those things that make you whole as a human being and then make you better at what you're doing. And so having that, um, uh, that element as a, an important part of your life is, I think, an invaluable asset of doing a great job. As the boss, respecting that in your team and the team around you and what you're building. Have to. Yeah. yeah. So if we move into the Disney years, uh, everyone has a favorite child. So do you have a favorite film from that time? <laughs> um, there are different movies that have, um, you know, different. Uh, so first of all, I, the other th genetic defect I have, um, in addition to those others that I gave you, is, is that um, uh, I, I, I don't have a, a, a reminiscent gene. Um, and, and so I tend not to look back. And most of all, when something's finished for me, it's I turn the chapter and I go to the next thing. And so I've, at least to date, I've not yet found that moment to turn back and actually be reflective in, in, a, in a way about it. But there are things and stories that I have told over the years that um, had a a connection to me because I had something to do with the idea itself, and the idea was in some way a reflection of something going on for me. I say that, um, and I want to wave the flag of saying uh, I had some piece in that because I, I, I don't want to take credit from great writers, great directors, great filmmakers whose names are on these things. It's just, you know, there was this. Sam Goldwyn, who was one of the great producers in early Hollywood, uh, had a, an expression which I, I, I loved, which he said, you know, credit you give yourself isn't worth having. And so I, 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 I say that as a caveat here of the story of The Lion King is a reflection of something that happened to me in my life in my 20s. And I wanted to tell that in a story. Not the Hamlet part. That I had nothing to do with. <laughs> There's a guy, Willie Shakes something or other. He was that. Uh, but the, the notion that, um, uh, for those of you who may have a minor memory of this, is, is that uh, Simba believes that he was responsible for the death of his dad. And he runs because he does not feel he can confront that truth to his mom and to his family and to his tribe. And so he goes away and finds Pumbaa and Timon and Akuna Matata. And eventually, Nala shows up, um, this childhood friend of his, and reminds him of what's there. And then between Rafiki uh, shaking his magic wand, and Mufasa from up there, you must return. Uh, <laughs> he goes back and faces his truth. And I had a situation in my life, in my career, in which that happened to me, not in the familial way, which I felt would be the way in which we could all relate to it, but there was a set of circumstances in which everything was on the line for me, and there was a chance for me to cut and run, and, and I knew ultimately someday I, I, you cannot run from the truth. The truth will find you. And so I made a very bold and very hard and very difficult decision for me to come back and face the truth. And by the way, the outcome was great you know, for, for me in doing that. And I just felt that was such a life learning lesson for me that I, I wanted to try and tell that in a story. There's another movie I made which probably many of you have never know or maybe barely heard about, which was uh, also a reflection of something for me, which is um, about how I feel about um, uh, life. I, I actually don't like the word no. 
Maybe some of you do, but that doesn't work for me. And pretty much any, any you know, I, I, and so there was a movie called Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron. And it's a, it was the last uh, hand-drawn animated movie that uh, I made as that sort of revolution of CG came along. Shrek was the next one after it. Um, and it was a very, very, it was my homage to, um, uh, you know, really um, w one of the great things that I, I think Walt Disney uh, did, um, uh, which was it's, it's to allow animation to, to, to be uh, its, its, its best and, and to um, let the pictures do all the storytelling. So the lead character, which is this indomitable character, spirit, um, he, he, he doesn't talk, right? So there's, it, it relies on animation to actually tell itself. And it's a musical, and it, nobody sings, other than Brian Adams, who sings this sort of, uh, you know, kind of soundtrack to it. So it was a really incredibly ambitious, very risky animated movie that failed. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but not for me. And that story specifically of Spirit, um, which is he is a character that no matter what the circumstances, his optimism uh, and his determination would not allow him to fail. And that's, that's me. I, I'm, I'm, I just, you know, I have, you know, just uh, a, a bottomless well of optimism. And uh, so, and then the uh, third one is I grew up across from the New York City Central Park Zoo. And I used to go there as a young kid, five, six, seven, eight years old. And uh, it, I always, when I would see, uh, the zoo through you know, my eyes as a, you know, as, a, as a kid, I thought, well, they live on Fifth Avenue. I'd see they got fed steak every day. They were groomed and taken care of, and their cages will all be washed and cleaned every day. And I thought, God, these animals, like, they're, they, like, they live in the top of the line. And I thought, well, what would happen if they had to actually go back to Africa? And there is Madagascar. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like this incredibly personal connection for you in making these films is the one, the ones that really stick with you. Well, you, the animated ones for sure, life. but they're great movies over the years that are just, you know, wonderful things where great filmmakers, great storytellers, great artists, you know, had these amazing stories they wanted to tell and just to kind of be on the sideline cheerleading them, helping them uh, realize those things was just very exciting. But, you know, I, I made, 406 live action movies. When I say I made, they were made while I was, you know, overseeing uh, these studios over the years and 41 animated movies. And, you know, it was a lot. And man, there are just a ton of dogs in there. <laughs> <laughs> you had a, an abrupt departure from Disney. Can you talk to us about what that was like? Uh, sure. Um, so, in the summer of 1994, um, the number one movie in the world was The Lion King. Um, the number one uh, album, uh, soundtrack, or actually record, period, was uh, soundtrack to Lion King. Sold 27, 28 million hard copies. Anybody want to think about that today? With that, <laughs> with that light, well, that's how, how extraordinary that is. Um, the number one home video in the world was from Aladdin the year before. Uh, the number one show on Broadway was Beauty and the Beast. The number one TV show was a show we produced called Home Improvement. The number one book on the New York Times best. You get the idea. <laughs> it's like, at a moment in time, and I, I don't know whether that's happened again since or not, maybe it has uh, certainly possible for the Disney company today. We had number one of every single place that we produced for, which is pretty much across the entire spectrum of things that are around entertainment and culture. I got fired. Um, and, um, uh, and it was horribly ugly. I mean, it was a, it was a you know, uh, I had, I'd been together uh, 
uh, with the CEO of the company, Michael Eisner and I had been partners together for 18 and a half years. And uh, I guess the analogy I would make, except I'm fortunate and I have not experienced this, but I have friends that have, it's like a marriage that went perfectly to a point and then somehow or another just got unaligned. And I, there's a reason for this is, is that Michael and I had this amazing marriage counselor who was the president of the company, an amazing guy, selfless, one of the most selfless people I've ever met. His name is Frank Wells. And so there was Michael as the CEO of the company, and Frank was the COO, and um, I was the CEO of the, of the Walt Disney Studios. And Frank, <coughs> for <coughs> all of these years, 10, 10 years, he was the guy that always kind of made things right between Michael and I, and that when we would sort of get unaligned or at each other, or I wasn't being sensitive enough or not being inclusive, or whatever those things are, Frank would come in my office, sit down and put his feet up on the table and go, I think there's a better way of doing this. And he managed to do that. And then quite tragically, in April of 1994, he died in a helicopter crash. You know, this is where, you know, my, my partner, one of my partners always said to me, Jeffrey, you know, there's your plan and there's God's plan and your plan doesn't count. And this is one of those moments where suddenly everything that worked, nothing worked. And, uh, and so Michael and I got sideways with one another uh, very quickly and, and, and in a way that became this amazing eruption. And, um, and he fired me. And at, at, at the moment in time in which I was doing my job as well as I'd ever done it before. And, uh, and at the time, it was incredibly public and incredibly ugly and very personal and very nasty. And it resulted in a lawsuit and, you know, just went on for a really long time. And I would have to rank that as probably my greatest regret professionally. Not that I got fired. It's how I got fired. And that may not make any sense to you, but um, the, I, I just look back today and I, there must have been a better way for me to go about separating. And, and, and I, I, if I could have a do-over, at least I would try and do that. And I don't know that it would have a, a different outcome. I don't think it would, but it would have had a better way to get to the outcome of it. Because it's the most humiliating, embarrassing uh, moment of my of, of my career. I felt just completely, uh, you know, demeaned by it and, and uh, you know, just hurt by it. And it just, it was, it was hard. Eight days later, after getting fired, I started DreamWorks with David Gavin and Steven Spielberg. So I got over it in about seven and a half days. <laughs> 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 Pretty quick turnaround. Yes. Uh, but I just I hear so much love for the films and the people involved at Disney, and, and I just I really appreciate that you shared all of that with us. Um, but you did. You turned right around and took an entrepreneurial leap when you could have taken an operating role at any of the established studios with the track record. I mean, you just made number one in every measure. So why take the leap? Um, well, again, I... You know, the sort of recurring thing for me, and literally going back to those days of Lindsay and Paramount and Disney and DreamWorks and again here today, now, um, I, I, have, I have loved the idea of a, a blank slate. I know for most people, you know, uh, that's a scary it's a scary thing, particularly, you know, most of these are almost, almost like... Uh, clockwork. You know, these have been 10-year chapters in my career, and so they're long, and they're deep roots, and it's attached to people and projects and um, friends and family and, that I grew up with in each of these chapters. But I find that for, for me, whether it's the circumstances changed, the team broke up, or I got fired, starting over has always been fantastic for me. And what has come in front of me has always, every single time, no matter how great the circumstances, so as great as Paramount was for me or Disney was for me, and they were fantastic times and incredible decades there and so much to love and be proud of. What came next was better. And so when Comcast showed up a year and a half ago, 
I thought I would, my third act was going to be doing, you know, another 10 years of DreamWorks and making number 407 and 42. <laughs> um, and, and at first it was like, well, what do you mean you want my company and you don't want me? <laughs> it's like, well, I'm kind of hurt by that for a moment. And then I thought about it, and honestly, one day I woke up the next morning and I went, no, 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 wait a minute. This is a chance to be 25 years old again with extraordinary, extraordinary resources and contacts and all of these things. And like, I just, I, honestly, I never, I never imagined there would be another get to start all over again. And the moment that that idea uh, just came into my, my head, I couldn't get out, I couldn't get it away. And it became more exciting to me. And so, you know, passing the baton to the NBC Universal people on DreamWorks seemed like the most obvious must do thing. It was better for my employees because they would be part of this $200 billion company. I have more job security and more resources. And these are people that had been with me for a long time. And I felt a great sense of obligation and loyalty to them. I could afford to take risks. They m might not, you know. Uh, and all of these characters and movies and IP that we had created to put them in the hands of people that, you know, could make them live forever if they so choose to. There couldn't be a better place or a better organization to, to, to do that. Um, and for the shareholders, it was an extraordinary outcome. The stock was selling at twenty-one dollars a share. They bought it for forty-one dollars a share. And so, I didn't. I I couldn't put myself in in the way of all of those three outcomes, which were better for, for everybody. And then once that idea of like, okay, you can start all over again, I went, touchdown, let's go. You made it. So you are looking into the future with excitement in your new venture. You are looking for the team to pull around you. And before we were talking, you described building a team for a business as a casting process. So how are you casting for your new venture right now? Well, um, again, I, you know, one of the recurring things for me over the years is I've always had great mentors, as I talked about Barry Diller, but Michael Eisner was a great mentor. Again, we were together for you know, 18 and a half of those years. It was a phenomenal partnership, and um, I learned so much from him. And so I've had a series of amazing mentors over the years, two people who were mentors that went on to do something different were one Barry Diller and he started this company called IAC about 25 years ago um, uh, and the other was John Malone and Liberty Media and and I saw in what they did something that excited me because I am a, a builder and I'm an operator I'm not an investor um, and I believe that the most valuable thing is human capital um, you you know, to do to build businesses, to do things, uh, obviously you need the cash to be able to do it. But the most valuable thing is human capital. And so, in starting Wonderco, I wanted to put together a, a partnership of people that, if today you were going to have a business, either one that you were starting or one that you already had started, and you wanted exceptional resources to help you take that to some you know great new plateau that within wonderco we actually had everything you would want in a c-suite you have a great strategist you have a, a, a great marketing executive you have a general counsel a cfo a, a coo a ceo like everything that you would want in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a place like that we, we got some of and so to have that as sort of the resource, because when I look at Barry Diller and John Malone, that's what they've done. They have found companies around ideas and around uh, entrepreneurs, and then they have put a ton of, uh, you know, of, of people capital into those enterprises. And you know, Diller started IAC 25 years ago. His idea was the intersection uh, of the internet and to be able to create a commercial consumer transactions on it. So everything from Expedia to, I'm sure no one in this room has ever actually done anything that has anything to do with Match.com. Um, <laughs> so, you know, he, he's just, and he's, Barry's probably built literally 70, 80, 90 billion dollars worth of market cap. I mean, it's like a quiet story, not maybe that well told, but he's literally one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time. And I think right now today, is exactly another one of those moments. And today that intersection is 
um, uh, technology and the intersection of uh, video and the application of video against uh, or, or integrated with technology and how transformative and imperative that is going to be for what I think is the next evolutionary, if not revolutionary, um, uh, part of, uh, uh, of our world today. And I'll try and maybe translate that, which is if you go back maybe, uh, I don't know, 12, 14 years ago, um, everybody was on a thing called a Nextel. Most people in this room were too. This is you could send a text to somebody on this little sort of pager device. Somebody up here laughed. That's probably over forty. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then we went from that to a to a uh, flip phone, and you had to actually hit three times to get an R. I know this. I'm speaking you know Swahili to you, but <laughs> trust me. And then I'm now getting into territory here. We went to a BlackBerry and then from a BlackBerry to a smartphone. And so in the course of about 12, 14 years, everything around text, the application of text, the platforms around text. So if you think about communication, collaboration, sharing, search, e-commerce, and even entertainment, in a very short handful of years, um, text became ubiquitous. The enterprises built around text became worth hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars. Um, and all of us became expert at it. So like literally, the ability of all of us and any of us and every one of us to use text against those seven verticals today is honestly as easy as putting one foot in front of another. So then about five, six years after that happened, the next thing that happened in that sort of evolution was photography. And so today, every single one of us is like a junior Annie Leibovitz. Like we can all take great photos, no matter how inept we are, we can't help but take great photos. And so now think about in these last four or five years, the impact that photography has had. So we've moved, and it's not, it's not displaced text, it's added on text, why? Because a picture is, a thousand, is better than a thousand words. You've heard that said before, and it so now you think about communication, collaboration, you get it. <laughs> the application of photography has been transformed, and once again, many hundreds of billions of dollars of market values, but whether it's you know Instagram or Pinterest, and we can go on and on. Okay. So we're now in the third cycle. The sort of next third evolutionary is the application of video against each of those very specific verticals. And you're seeing what happens when people come along and come up with the application of, of, of putting these, things to, these two things together. So two perfect examples of it are Snapchat, right, in the, in the world of communication and sharing. If you think about in entertainment, best example of it's Netflix. You know, Netflix, as people forget it, was they were, you, again, I don't know if anybody remembers, you used to have a, a red envelope with a DVD in it. That's only seven years ago. You know, now it's, it's, it's streaming and a hundred billion dollar market cap over the intersection of video and technology. So for us today, we have a team that we have built that we think bridges that world. And um, uh, we, there's uh, 12 of us, nine of which came, are graduates at Stanford, so thank you all very much. <laughs> uh, one of us is not a, graduate of Stanford, he couldn't get in here, so he went to Harvard Business School instead. Um, but he teaches here, which is Sujay Jaswal. We should stand up and wave hello there, because hopefully some of you are being taught by him today. Come on, Sujay, show that t-shirt off. Stand up. Stand up. There we go. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we have a partnership that I think is a great uh, marriage and collaboration between Northern California and Southern California, which right now at this moment in time is highly unique because we are different cultures, we actually speak different languages, um, but our codependency on one another, the integration of these two worlds is, uh, is like literally these two trains that are on their way at one another. And so for WonderCo, we believe we have the human capital to facilitate that and to take advantage of it and to be entrepreneurial around it. 
an incredible vision. You seem to have pretty boundless ambition for what's to come, and Meg Whitman is obviously going to lend a huge amount of experience to that. Well, it's a perfect example. I've known Meg for 30 years. She's truly one of the most extraordinary leaders and, um, uh, and, and just great, great people. She was on my board at DreamWorks Animation. We met when I was at Disney. We've started this new business, which is right now, we, as our working title, is called New TV. But it's an incredibly, incredibly exciting, ambitious, improbable, likely impossible dream that she and I now are sharing. And, you know, um, and it can only work by putting our two worlds together. And she brings, you know, just a level of, of knowledge and expertise. She's, you know, been at every, whether it's what she did at eBay or you know, uh, uh, certainly at HP. She just has an incredible, incredible set of uh, skills I don't. And it, it is, I, I believe, it is one of those things where one plus one is going to equal 11. I'm excited to see it. I want to thank you for everything that you've shared with us so far. We're going to pause for a moment to open up to questions. Love and it. and uh, then we'll close again. Great. All right, um, my name is David, and I'm a second year here, and um, I'm inspired by your talk of the, mo or the, the movement from the first to second to third wave of video. Um, does WonderCo have any sort of ambitions on saying what's after the third wave? Well, no, because we've got to get to the third wave. <laughs> you know, I think we're at the beginning of the beginning of the third wave, but I actually think that, you know, when you could just, you know, you just imagine what the application is. Let me give you just one place here, which is you know, e-commerce. So think about how much e-commerce was changed from text to photo, right? That the ability that you could actually look at commerce on, a, on, on, on your phone and see uh, uh, displayed for you, you know, every single version of a Nike sneaker you could imagine. Right? OK, now move to video. And video, which is how the human being actually functions, sight and sound, is really the way in which we ingest data in the most effective, most efficient way. And we can put emotions around those things. So now think about how all those versions of Nike will look like in video. So it, it, the, and I say that because we're in Mr. Nike's uh, uh, home here. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> we can thank him for, for this. So. Um, but the application of video for commerce is going to be transformative. As much as we think we're, you know, had a, uh, you know, I would say we're in, in that sort of evolutionary, revolutionary moment from retail into uh, e-commerce, I would, I would bet that we'll look at five, seven years from now, it won't look anything like, I mean, it'll be, it just go to a whole nother level by the application of video. Just that one. Now we can go to the other verticals, and I think it'll be as impactful. I'm Arielle. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Uh, I'm an MBA one, and my question is what you learned uh, from your um, partnership with Spielberg and Geffen and how you've applied that into building WonderCo and how you'll build your future teams within the company. Um, well, it was, a, it was, I mean, it was an amazing uh, partnership um, and, and I think taught me about what, what the value of partnering can be. When Stephen and Dave and I came together in 1994, uh, if you went to Las Vegas, probably, as many of you are going to tonight, you could place a bet on how long would the three of them be able to be in the same sandbox without killing each other, right? And the odds were, you know, 100 to 1 that it would blow up in a year or two. <coughs> um, but what Stephen and David and I found in each other <coughs> is very specific um, expertise and as partners we actually could rely on one another so quite obviously in the world of storytelling um, you know Steven Spielberg arguably is the greatest storyteller certainly among the greatest storytellers of our of our time and so to defer to him as the sort of final arbiter in that regard seemed easy and good to do <clears throat> and even for me who had had you know amazing success before we came to that partnership. I, I always felt deferential, 
and even on our animated movies, you know, I would always bring Steven in. I mean, right up to the very end, once a week, he'd come over and, you know, give me a morning, and I would engage him in every way and any way. I didn't always agree with him, but I always wanted to hear uh, what he would have to say. David Geffen in the media space uh, is probably the most successful entrepreneur of our time. He literally made billions and billions and billions of dollars from, you know, being you know brilliant in the music business, brilliant in Broadway, successful movie producer. It's just the guy has taste, and everything he did worked. Um, and so, but most of all, a fantastic entrepreneur. So, and I'm the builder, right? So we had a dreamer an entrepreneur, and a builder. And those three things were just incredible and, and, and supportive of one another. And so finding that and being able to respect that in one another, I thought it was a bargain. Because in 1994, as I said, I had just been fired. Steven Spielberg had won the Academy Award in the spring of 1994 for Schindler's List. And in June of 1994, he put out the first Jurassic Park. So in our world, he had won both the Academy Award and the Bank of America Award, something <laughs> rarely somebody does those two at the same time. <laughs> David Geffen had actually just recently sold his music company for the third or fourth time for another billion dollars to Universal. And when I got fired, I went back to my office. I left Eisner's office, and when I Walk back to my, I did not know this at the time, just to give you an idea how kind of nasty it got. So I'm in his, his office, and he says, well, I don't think this is going to work any longer, stating what would have, at that point was truly the obvious. What I didn't know is while I was in his office, he put a press release out saying that he had fired me, right? So uh, I get back to my office, and literally I walk into my office, and my assistant says to me, Steven Spielberg and Bob Zemeckis are on the phone, and they would not hang up. They've insisted on holding on until you come back there in Jamaica together. So with the three of us had made a movie called Roger Rabbit together, and actually had kind of a great bond and you know, relationship came out of, out of that movie. And so I get on the phone, and they're laughing. They go, oh my god, this is fantastic. It's just great, and it's, it's, it's funny. And, they're, and I'm going, really? <laughs> <laughs> Explain to me how I'm, what I'm missing here, because I'm not feeling any of this, guys. <laughs> and Bob Zemeckis, I, have, I will give him the credit for it. Bob Zemeckis says, you know what, Jeffrey? You should just start your own studio. And I hung up the phone and went, hmm, now that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that was the moment. <laughs> so we're almost out of time. To close, I would ask you to dig the reminiscence gene just one more time for <laughs> us on stage. Uh, at the, on the day of the September 11th attacks, the entire country is paralyzed in shock and mourning, and you spring into action. You activate that sense of personal responsibility, and you put yourself at the center. Can you describe that moment for us and, and your leadership? Through? Yeah. Um, it, um, uh, you know, it, it it, it was a moment for uh, everybody, you know, in this country, if not around the globe, in which you, you know, that you, you know, I think every single person was not only feeling fear, but also helplessness, and most of all, what can I do? And I, I thought about that. I, I felt like I have to do something. I'm not a fireman. I'm not a policeman. I'm not a soldier. I'm an entertainer. Most of all, above all, what I've tried to do my whole life is actually bring laughter to people. That's been my mission. And if you think about the movies, and you know, the most joyful, rewarding thing for me is to stand in the back of a theater and hear an audience in, in laughter. That's my joy. And it's literally the most beautiful thing in the world to me is to hear laughter, and particularly the laughter of children. Um, and I thought, OK, you know, we, we, it would be great if we could have a shared healing moment. And, and we, my community of entertainers, actually could do something. And so I, I, I had this idea of doing a telethon um, that would be a tribute to 
uh, America and the strength of our country and uh, was able to do the thing I am, I was able to do, which is to get everybody and anybody on the telephone and talk them into doing something that they never would ever think of doing or want, I, mean, I would say think of doing something they would not likely do. And so for the first time actually in history, every single television station, every cable station, every radio, every everything for that two hours stopped while the greatest and the best and you know, <clears throat> entertainers, singers, actors um, spoke from the heart. And, and, and I, I just, for me, when I think of all of the wonderful things that I have been able to do and had in my career, honestly, nothing even comes remotely close to that moment and that time in which I felt, you know, it was, it was the ultimate unifying shared m moment. And just for a second, I felt maybe there was, at this tragic, tragic time, happiness. Thank you so much for the gifts that you've given us over an incredible career. And today in this auditorium, we are so blessed to hear Thank your you. lessons on leadership. Thank you.